Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Eric Van Zant. He's uh, one of our beef research faculty in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences. Uh, he's been with UK for 22 years now, and most of his research has been in uh, forage-based nutrition. And uh, out of that work is where he sort of got interested in uh, looking at how temperament affects performance, which is what he's going to talk to us about tonight. Uh, in addition to his uh, research program, he's also got teaching responsibilities. So he's uh, taught the feeds and feeding course for under for the undergraduate students as well as animal nutrition. Uh, currently, he's teaching a senior capstone course as well as a intro uh, class for incoming freshmen in the for the College of Agriculture, and he also um, has some graduate uh, teaching and training that he does in addition to all of that. So um, we're glad to have him here tonight and share with us a little bit about his research program. So I will go ahead and turn that over to him. Don't forget to um, put your comments in the chat. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, screen sharing working? Yep, looks good. Good, okay. Hopefully I can advance slides and everything. So yeah, thanks again. Um, Dare asked me to visit with you guys about some of the work that we're doing related to temperament. Uh, this talk's a little bit different for me for a couple reasons. One, um, it's not so much about sharing data from particular research studies that I've done, which is what I'm pretty used to doing. It's more about talking about the direction of our, our research program and some of the ideas behind that. The other reason it's a little bit different than most talks that I've given is that this is the first time I've given this type of talk without wearing shoes. So with that, here we go. So one of the challenges with doing research on temperament is that everybody knows what temperament means. Um, we all get pictures in our head when we think about temperament um, and what it means and uh, there's a lot of similarity probably between those pictures, but they're not the same for any of us. Um, and so on one hand, we all know what a temperamental animal is. We also know uh, what a calm and docile animal is. Um, but when it comes to trying to do research, it's a bit more challenging, right? It's not enough to just have this kind of general idea of what we're talking about. Um, throughout the years, there have been a lot of researchers, and there's a tremendous amount of work going on right now around our country and around the world looking at temperament. Um, interestingly, this stuff goes back quite a ways. The earliest definition that I found of temperament from the 1940s was by a researcher by the name of Kelly here, um, and who gave one of my favorite definitions of all time right here, uh, the ability to kick with accuracy and force. Um, you'll notice that most of these definitions through time by researchers have related to uh, interactions between animals and humans, right? So it has to do with our ability to handle animals and, um, you know, the behavioral responses to human handling. In more recent times, we've recognized that there's a lot of behaviors, things that we would probably categorize as temperament that aren't necessarily related to our interactions uh, with humans. Um, just as an example, there's a lot of different tests that have been used to measure temperament. Um, Heather Burrow, an Australian researcher who's quite famous for a lot of her work in uh, temperament and beef cattle in particular, did a really nice review article several years ago where she categorized the various uh, types of tests that were out there and we see that they're you know they range from things that are done under non-restrained conditions so things out in the pasture the lot uh, such as you know approachability of the animals flight distance those types of things uh, set of tests that we would consider to be done under restrained conditions most of the stuff I'm going to talk about today would fit more in this category uh, things like shoot scores um, even exit velocity, which I'll spend a bit of time talking about today, uh, those things that you know directly related to human interaction. But there's a lot of things. So, for example, uh, you know, dominance behaviors, how these animals relate 
uh, amongst themselves, uh, things having to do with the dominance hierarchy that don't really relate to their interaction with humans per se, but could be important parts of their temperament that have influence on their performance. And of course, maternal temperament, particularly in cow-calf settings, uh, we know that, you know, that, that that's hugely important. We need moms that are attentive to their calves and that will protect those calves. Um, and so a lot of different types of tests. And so when we start doing research on this, it becomes imperative that we really focus in on exactly what it is that we're measuring. And one of the things that I really stress for, for my students, uh, particularly in my capstone class, is that things are defined by the way that they're measured. And so for us just to talk about temperament in general is really hard. We have to get a lot more specific. One of the most commonly used temperament measures uh, that, that in the United States and throughout the world there was one that Temple Grandin published back in the early 90s. Pretty simple, right? So this is a shoot scoring, uh, a shoot score measure. So animals are caught uh, in the head catch, no squeeze applied, and then you observe them and rate them on a one to five scale uh, from calm uh, cattle to those that are trying to sh tear the shoot down. Uh, would be a five. Um, so this is an attempt to take this, uh, you know, kind of uh, vague idea of temperament and quantify it so that we can use it in a research setting. And we've had some reasonable success with this, but recognize this is still a subjective measure and that presents some challenges for us from a research standpoint. Um, it's also the case that outside the research environment, there's a lot of recognition of how important this is. And it turns out that the, the BIF facility score guidelines have been widely adopted by different uh, breed associations. Um, these uh, guidelines are really useful for what they're intended to do. Um, again, this one's claims to be a shoot score, but as we look at the details that they associate with their one to six scale here, we see that in each case, there are elements of these things that have to do with exit velocity. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, in addition to how they're acting on the shoot, and in some of their higher score categories, their four, five, and six categories, they actually have factors that they're including that have really nothing to do with uh, how they're acting in confinement, you know, in a restrained situation. So frantically runs fence line. Um, uh, some of these, yeah, may include uh, uh, attack behavior, these types of things that really don't have a lot to do with behavior in the shoot per se. So again, uh, this system is well designed for what it's intended for, but from a research standpoint, trying to combine these different types of measures together is problematic. And I hope that some of the data that I'm about to show you will really kind of drive that point home. Um, so, yeah, I kind of raised this question, right? The, the, you know, we got kind of all know what temperament means, but it turns out that what it means really depends on what we're after. Um, historically, most of the research that's out there um, has been focused on the really important strategies of, uh, you know, selecting animals, um, comparing breeds, uh, selecting individual animals to try to improve the temperament in our herds. There has been a fair bit of research on uh, techniques for uh, acclimatizing animals to handling scenarios to, to calm them down and, and improve their temperament. But there really hasn't been a lot focused on what I'm going to talk about today, and that's uh, capitalizing on some of the differences that exist in, in temperament. Now, I don't want you to think that I don't understand the importance of the, you know, uh, using temperament in selection programs and trying to weed out the crazy animals. Um, I decided to share this short video clip with you guys. Um, so this is our handling facilities out at Woodford County from a few years ago. And we do occasionally get situations like this. And Fortunately, yeah, this guy was able to make it in, clear everything out, make it back out without any major catastrophes. Um, pretty certain, yeah, that was like five years ago. I'm pretty certain that if that happened today, I wouldn't be quite so fleet of foot to be able to, to avoid catastrophe there. But fortunately, in that case, we got everybody out of the way. So I absolutely understand that is, you know, 
an important aspect of temperament and we'd like to minimize those animals that are in the herd. However, that's not the focus of my research program. Um, and so one of the most important things I wanted to share with you guys today is some of the guiding principles in kind of what we're doing with temperament. Um, and one of those is just this idea that differences in temperament are always going to exist. We have cows, uh, particularly in the beef herd, right? We have cows raised under extremely varying conditions in this country and throughout the world, um, from extensive range conditions in the high plains and west to, you know, smaller family farms. Uh, it's important in a lot of those situations, right, that we've got cows that retain some level of aggression uh, to protect their calves, uh, you know, to be good moms and those things. Just given the variety of, of environments that cows, beef cows are raised in, we're always going to have differences in temperament. Um, and I think that we can capitalize on those. And so that's a lot of what we're trying to do with our research program. Um, second guiding principle is that there is a huge amount of research out there um, and stretching back a number of years, and I'm showing stuff here going back to the 1950s, where they found relationships between temperament and milk production in dairy cows. Um, since the 80s, there's been a fair bit of focus, particularly in Australia and in the States, on relationships between temperament and carcass quality, gain, intake, feed efficiency, immunological function. We know those things exist. Um, and we still have quite a ways to go to really understand them well enough to, to take advantage of that, but I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. So the other problem, the other guiding principle, I guess, for our research program is that in most of the research to date, we're still measuring temperament in pretty fuzzy ways, I think, and that takes form in a couple different ways. Um, one way is that a lot of the, the systems that we have are subjective. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to deal with some of that subjectivity. So at our Woodford County facility, we're really fortunate. We've got some pretty nice toys that we can play with out there. You can note that our squeeze chute uh, is suspended by load cells from this frame. So we're able to get individual weights on animals that feed into this electronic scale head. Um, I was able to plumb into that scale head, so it's connected to this computer, and we're able to collect uh, real time all the, the variations that are being you know, read on that scale head that are usually a nuisance, right? When you're trying to get a weight, we're able to collect all that data at five times a second and use that in such a way to get what I call an objective shoot score. So you'll see this animal. Uh, every time it jumps on there, we all know that scale's bouncing all over the place. We're capturing that and using that as, as uh, data to generate a shoot score for that animal rather than depending on my subjective assessment. You just notice when that animal has escaped, when that we let that animal go, uh, we uh, have infrared sensors set up here that collect the exit velocity on that animal. So one of the things that we've learned is that it's really important to keep those measures separate. A lot of the research that's out there, folks are trying to combine those measures in some way and call it some type of a temperament index. Uh, to me, that really decreases the value of these measures um, when we're trying to do useful stuff with them. And let me explain that a little bit clearer, I guess. So, so this is just one example. We've got a lot of data like this. This is from one study um, looking at relationships between the objective shoot score. So anywhere you see OCS, I'm talking about that shoot score that we got using the scale head versus that exit velocity of that animal as it came out of the chute. And yeah, there's a relationship here. These things are correlated. There's a positive relationship between shoot score and, and exit velocity, but a very weak relationship. Um, and so what this allows us to do, because these things are largely independent, we can look at these things independently of each other. So this gives me groups of animals that are 
uh, low objective shoot scores, so low shoot score, slow animals. There's a, you know, about a quarter of the animals that would fit that category. About a quarter of them are going to be high shoot score, slow animals. A quarter would be low shoot score, fast animals. And a quarter would be high shoot score, fast animals. And we can sort them into these groups and then look at their responses to, you know, how do they grow, uh, what's their feed efficiency, and those types of things. So here's results from an early study that we did where we did exactly that. This was a short 58-day uh, growing study, backgrounding study, if you will. Uh, these were probably about 580-pound calves coming in. Um, and so what we're looking at here in each case, so I've got intake, feed efficiency, and average daily gain. And in each case, I'm looking on the left side at the effects of our exit velocity measurements, and then on the right side, our shoot score effects. So this is really consistent, not just within our work, but across the country. We get uh, lower intake pretty consistently in these fast shoot score animals. And I, I need to point out that these studies, almost all the studies that we do are on you know, typical uh, Kentucky calves. These are coming out of sale barns. Some, some are raised on, on our farm here in, in Woodford County, but largely on sale barn uh, cattle from central Kentucky sale barns. Um, and by and large, these are pretty calm cattle. You would not go through and look at these things and, and you know, call them temperamental or flighty or you know, nervous cattle by any means. Uh, as a whole, they're pretty calm cattle. So it's important that we're still picking up differences in these animals, even when we've got pretty uniform, calm groups of cattle. Um, now, interestingly, when we looked at shoot score on some of these early studies that we did, it was not at all like we might expect. We're actually seeing a different you know, increase in intake by these shoot shakers, if you will, the high shoot score animals, uh, eating a little bit more. But at the same time, they were converting it less efficiently. Okay, so converting this is gain to feed, shown on these gold bars. They were converting that less efficiently. So at the end of the day, they didn't gain differently, right? We had similar average daily gain between the low and the high shoot score animals, but they're still physiologically different. There's something different about the low and the high animals there. Um, these exit velocity differences were pretty consistent. Sometimes we will see lower efficiency as well for these high exit velocity animals. Didn't have that here, but they did eat less. and as consistent as anything that's out there, they grew at lower lower rates, right? At lower average daily gain on high exit velocity. That's one of the more consistent messages that we see in, in our data and, and other data. So to me, what this suggested was that if these animals are growing different, they've got some physiological differences in their eating, you know, in their intake uh, levels and efficiencies maybe they respond differently to different feeding systems. So one study that we did uh, several years ago was to look at whether they respond to rumensin differently. So we have those same four groups that I just talked about, right? And we either, we take half of each group and put them on a controlled diet without rumensin and the other half with rumensin. We've done this both with growing cattle and with finishing cattle. I'm gonna show you just the growing cattle results here. Um, as expected, Romanson knocks intake down. We know that. That's about as consistent a thing. Didn't matter. Uh, I should point out that in this case, surprised the heck out of me, but I thought exit velocity was going to change the way they responded to Romanson. It didn't, but our shoot score did. So, so as I said, in both groups, didn't matter. Low, high, shoot score. Uh, they ate less. But here's where the, the di interesting difference was. Uh, high shoot score animals, shoot shakers, responded classically, just like we'd expect with Rumensen. They ate less, they were more efficient, and as a consequence, they gained the same. So th this, you know, this is cattle gaining the same on less feed, more efficient, e probably economically, you know, makes sense to put Rumensen in their diet. Uh, low shoot score animals ate less, no difference in efficiency. They did not respond to rumensin as we would typically expect, and as a consequence, their gain was lower. So without getting too worried about all the details in there, I think the take home message here is that we know temperament is related to intake, related to gain, related to efficiency, and other things. Um, and importantly to me out of this is that we can see that animals with different temperament measures can respond differently to diet manipulation, 
In this case, it was monensin, but it could be any number of other things, the degradable protein in the diet, energy levels, uh, all sorts of different things. Um, and also, I didn't show you this data, but we've also found that sorting animals into temperament groups can affect how they respond, as opposed to you know, leaving them all together out in one large pen. Um, so to me, all of this stuff indicates that there is opportunity to utilize these temperament differences and as we learn more to strategize and feed them appropriately. Um, just real quickly, I wanted to touch on a few other questions that we've addressed over the years. Um, one likely thing, particularly I think as we think about some of these shoot score things, is that maybe related to how aggressive they are at the feed bunk. Maybe those are the more dominant animals and, you know, that's, that's why they're eating more is because, you know, they're, they're more aggressive at the feed bunk. So we've actually done studies to look at that. We've got the ability to watch these guys 24-7, um, done a number of studies where we've recorded, recorded them particularly around feeding time to get uh, uh, and, and gone in and, and made very specific measurements to get up dominance hierarchies on these animals. Um, so we can come in and, and give each of them, you know, like th this is probably the submiss most submissive animal out of the group, right, that's hanging back at the feed bunk right now. We can tell from who whoops who at the feed bunk and those types of things, which animal is the most dominant. And so we were interested in how that might relate to temperament and some of these other factors. Um, turns out, uh, not so much. Um, we were not able to find any direct relationships between temp the, their social interactions, right? So this dominance index kind of shows where they are in that dominance hierarchy. Higher number means a more dominant animal. Um, yeah, a little bit confusing the way I presented it here. Maybe we can see we've got, you know, a couple of these uh, temperament groups that kind of sorted out to be more dominant, a couple that were less dominant, but there's really no relationship with, consistent relationship with either shoot score or exit velocity. And I also put their average daily gains over here, and you can see that, you know, whether they were high or low dominance really didn't uh, relate to what their average daily gains were either. We've got these two particularly dominant groups that represented the highest and the lowest average daily gains in the the whole study. So, and that's consistent with other work out there. So at this point, I'm a little bit less interested in, you know, in, in their uh, interspecies relationships, if you will, you know, how they relate to each other. I'm, I'm more interested in, you know, relating some of these other measures to productive responses. So yeah, another question, right? What about different diets? That's something that we're going to continue to look at. Uh, can we tailor some diets to fit these different animals a little bit better? Um, the other really intriguing question to me here is, how is this possible? You know, this rumensin response, how is it possible that that could be affecting, uh, you know, their, whether their high or low shoot score could be affecting how they respond to an antimicrobial in their diet? Um, there is a huge amount of really intriguing research, particularly with mice and with humans, that is demonstrating a real clear connection between the gut microbial population and behavior. This is one example from a pretty recent paper um, that happened to be looking at a real specific mechanism, but there's thousands of these papers out there now. This is the gut. This is showing signals that are coming directly from the microorganisms to the brain of the animal, and they've got some really intriguing hypotheses. This is one, but there's a number of different ways that these signals from the microbes can be affecting the brain to influence things like, look at this, social, reduced social interaction, increased anxiety and depression-like behavior. Um, we know that the gut microbes are hugely important. There's been almost no looking at this in ruminant animals where we know the gut microbial population is hugely influential. So there's a whole world of, of stuff that we have yet to explore here. Um, I'm also interested in whether there are some other uh, pretty straightforward measures that we might be able to use in addition to exit velocity and shoot score. And I think I failed to mention that we've really focused on those because what we're doing has to be using temperament measures that we can implement real time, right, without affecting, uh, without appreciably affecting the, the time it takes to work cattle through the chute. 
And there's a lot of other technologies that are available out there. We happen to be one of the earliest ones that was looking at ear tags with accelerometers. Um, at the time we did some of these studies, these were ear tags that we designed and had built here at the University of Kentucky that had accelerometers in them so we could measure like daily activity in these calves. Found some really interesting stuff. Again, I, this was another growing study. Um, this on the y-axis is just daily total counts on these accelerometers that are in the ears of these calves. And so then we've got, you know, day of experiment. I've got the same four groups uh, by separated by temperament over here. Couple interesting things that we see in this uh, data set. One, you know, from the day we started them on, brought them into the pens and started feeding them. These are, you know, silage based growing diets, corn silage based. Um, you know, we get these increases in activity and then all of a sudden, boom, we had this huge decrease. Uh, that was intriguing to me until my uh, uh, beef unit manager uh, pointed out to me that, oh, yeah, we booster vaccinated them. We gave them their, their vaccine boosters on day 14. Huge depression in activity on these cows. And it took them about two weeks to get back up to normal again. The other really intriguing thing out of this is if you look at the average daily gains for each of these groups that I put over here on the right, you see that those things follow almost right in line inversely, right, with, with their activity counts. The animals with lower activity counts, higher average daily gains. Um, now this could relate directly just to energy use to some extent, right? These guys might be a little more efficient because they're using less energy, but I think this is just another indication of uh, temper another temperament measure that gives us some pretty useful kind of information. Um, we've done other work looking at um, uh, re other things, important things that are related to temperament, immunological responses. We've got a good bit of research showing that there's some, it's really complicated, <laughs> but you know, there's some interesting relationships there. We've shown that maybe heat production, methane production are higher in these fast exit velocity calves, and certainly a lot of research across the country and, and all over showing relationships with carcass quality. Generally in that, yeah, these higher exit velocity animals at least uh, have lower, uh, you know, lower quality carcasses. Um, so overall, I think we've got some good evidence that at least this idea makes sense, right? Temperament-based management could be beneficial. This is the kind of evidence that I've uh, shared. There's some additional questions that are really intriguing. Um, some of these, uh, yeah, I guess we could discuss more maybe in question and answer since I'm using up my time. And just to, to wrap up then, yeah, I just want to point out that this is kind of where, where we're going. I want us to keep a focus on what we're actually measuring. It's hard when we start talking about temperament in general. So most of the stuff that we're doing, we're trying to keep the focus on exit velocity responses and shoot score responses. They are not the same. Uh, we need to keep those things different. We've got to get a better understanding on the mechanisms of what's going on. Is the gut microbial population involved? Uh, you know, to be able to predict what's going to happen, we've got to understand, you know, the, the physiology of it a lot better. Um, but I do think that we're going to, in the near future, we're going to be able to design both diet and management strategies, might involve, you know, different vaccination strategies, et cetera, uh, that will fit these different temperament groups. All right, thank you for your time. I will attempt to turn off my screen sharing. All right, so while our speakers are switching out, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Van Zant, feel free to type them in the question box. We'll get those answered. While you all are, are thinking about uh, some questions, I've got one to get us started. Um, Dr. Van Zant, what would you say would be the um, best way for producers who may want to start assessing temperament measures when they're working their cattle, which uh, system or, or when should they um, take those measures, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, good question. So most of the, the recommendations by the breed associations for doing facility scores and those types of things, although I, yeah, I don't think the Angus Association maybe uh, is in line with some of the others, but most of them recommend weaning is an ideal time, right, to collect this. And there's, uh, 
you know, part of the reason for that is that we want animals to have had minimal exposure to the facilities and, and handling. Um, so that's an ideal time. The other general recommendation is as yearlings, um, both of those are good. Um, and yeah, so as far as, as what to measure, the, the most consistent responses that are out there are to exit velocity. Now, that's as I, I suggested, it was a relatively easy and quick measure, something that's really easy for us. The setup for doing that, I mean, it's like a thousand bucks to buy those infrared sensors and the software and whatnot to be able to do that. So, you know, I mean, that's really dependent on scale, right? Whether that makes sense or not. However, Temple Grandin actually did some really good work going, <laughs> I guess this kind of goes backwards a little bit from what I was saying about object and subjective measures, but in this case, I think it makes a lot of sense. If you simply score animals coming out of the chute, walk, trot, run, right? You can set up a one to five scale of how fast they're coming out of the chute and do go a really long way toward having good information on exit velocity. So it really doesn't require any, well, assuming you have a chute, I guess, right? It doesn't require any uh, additional investment in equipment or software or anything like that to be able to get some of these numbers and have them in a meaningful way. You, you do need to think about consistency when trying to do that. Um, so consistency in the setup, right? So uh, I've seen some places where they've got like a right angle right outside of the chute and they've tried to do exit velocities with animals coming out and you know immediately turning. That probably doesn't work too well. Um, and consistency in handling the animals. Uh, we've got, you know, standard protocols that we try to implement where, you know, I mean, we're trying to be as uh, gentle and quiet and calm as possible, minimize use of hot shots. Um, occasionally they're still necessary, but rarely, we rarely, uh, and for us, it's more common that we need them after these animals, you know, been handled, I mean, we'll weigh them once every month for their lives, right? So it becomes common for them to balk a lot and occasionally we need them there. But, but just thinking about those things, right? Trying to be as consistent as possible and how to handle those animals as they're coming through the facilities to get decent, consistent kind of measures. Um, we got one question here for you real quick. Um, have you looked at any breed or genetic differences or potentially environmental differences um, as they would affect temperament? So, no, I have not, we, we haven't here, right, at, at, at uh, our research facility, we haven't looked at breed comparisons. There's quite a bit of that information out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, the Meat Animal Research Center is probably gonna be the best resource um, on, you know, breed comparisons and, and, you know, looking at docility indexes between breeds is, is very useful there. Um, the stuff that I've seen, yeah, I mean, no huge surprises there, uh, right? You know, Herefords tend to have better docility scores than Angus, which are better than, you know, some of the continental breeds and um, so that information's out there, but no, we haven't done that work per se. Um, environmental influences, that's huge. How these animals have been handled coming in. Um, that, that's been a challenge for us on, just because of the uh, approach that we've taken, right? So we're buying these calves out of sale barns. I don't know what the background is largely. Um, we try to get that information, but usually don't have it. And so what's been interesting to me is that, well, yeah, particularly on exit velocity, what's been interesting to me is that we're able to get these consistent relationships even without knowing that. So it's kind of, regardless of whether these animals are flighty because they were handled, you know, roughly had a you know, tough upbringing or because of genetic reasons. It seems that, you know, these relationships with growth, intake, efficiency still are borne out. Um, but, but absolutely, there's a lot to be learned there. Now, there's also a lot of interesting stuff, particularly out of Australia, where they've tried to work the temperament out of them, right? So let's train them, handle them a bunch, get them really calmed down and see if that'll improve their growth and feed efficiency. And interestingly, 
it will improve exit velocities. You can improve shoot scores by doing those things, but these animals are still physiologically different. Um, they still, you know, even after these intensive handling kind of things, they will not, uh, you know, they still don't grow as well and, and don't eat as well. So uh, a lot to be learned there yet, um, but it's still true that taking these measures, depending on, you know, what, what your situation is and what you're trying to do, but taking these measures on your cattle, even without knowing necessarily whether, whether it was environmental or genetic, can still be useful.